like to thank my colleagues who are here, Council Members Annabel Palma, Jessica Lappin, Delisa Ferreras, and Gail Brewer. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. I'd like to thank all the staff who helped to put together this hearing today, including Molly Murphy, Nina Taveras, Crystal Costin, and our new intern, Kara Krieger. Thank you very much. And I want to give a brief overview uh, before we turn to the administration's testimony. Yesterday was the fifth anniversary of Mayor Bloomberg's pledge to reduce New York City homelessness by two-thirds over five years. And yet, sadly, we have record numbers of families in shelter at this moment. So we've gone, unfortunately, in exactly the wrong direction. We're here today to examine new and troubling policies issued by the Department of Homeless Services related to homeless families with children. And we're concerned that these policies will drive up street homelessness and other social dislocations, specifically the income contribution requirement, ICR, that families with children pay for the cost of, speak, uh, the cost of shelter. And I want to note that Speaker Clinton and I have introduced Resolution 2002 that supports state legislation that would eliminate this requirement that families with children pay the cost for shelter. And secondly, we're going to look at standards describing when families with children can be evicted from shelter, standards that we believe are too flexible and can lead to, again, families ending up on the street. Now, on May 1st of this year, the city rolled out the ill-advised income contribution requirement, again, ICR. It's clear that families will and already have lost out under this new policy. Homeless families need to keep as much money in their pockets as possible, looking forward to the day when they can actually move out of shelter and into permanent housing. That should be our goal, but this ICR policy, in fact, works against that goal. This policy means that homeless families will have to decide between purchasing necessities versus paying for shelter. Their exit to permanent housing may be delayed if they have no savings to put towards the cost of housing. And shelter providers have to become bill collectors instead of case managers, which fundamentally changes their relationship to the people they're serving. In addition, families face serious consequences if they don't pay, most notably, ejection from shelter. Will the children of those families end up in foster care if the street is their only option? That's a serious question we have to ask ourselves. Remember, we're talking about families being ejected from shelter in the middle of the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression. Now, on May 21st, the state, the state of New York suspended the policy based on problems with how families were notified. Now, DHS has to reimburse money to families who were already who had already paid the money, causing further confusion and strife. DHS has said the state is requiring that this policy be implemented. However, New York City, we all know, has very, very unique circumstances, different than anywhere else in the state. Over 80% of the state's homeless families are in New York City. That's according to federal figures from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. And the costs of living and of housing in New York City are much higher than the rest of the state. So we obviously need to be treated differently. According to the National Coalition for the Homeless, some of the most prevalent causes of homelessness are eroding work opportunities, increased cost of living, low stock of affordable housing units, poverty, and the declining value of public assistance. It seems clear that in this economic climate, the city's policy places more of a burden on an already vulnerable population, and all of those unfortunate trends I just mentioned are affecting the poor of our city right now. If we want, if we really want to successfully move people from shelter into permanent housing, shouldn't the city be lobbying the state to exempt the city from this ICR requirement? I'm pleased that Assemblyman Keith Wright and Senator Daniel Squadron introduced legislation to change the state law that mandates this requirement. And again, Speaker Quinn and I have introduced Resolution 2002 that supports the legislation. And we're hoping we're, and we're praying that there could, this legislation all need to be acted on immediately. In fact, Assemblyman Wright's bill was passed this Monday, uh, this past Monday in Albany, in the Assembly. 
Uh, and so the assembly is recognizing the urgency of the problem and has done something about it. And we are hoping that despite the situation in the Senate, that this will be one of the uh, issues they take up in the coming days. And we need the city to urgently and intensely support the elimination of this requirement in Albany and be a part of that solution and play an active role. Now the second issue we're here to talk about is the manner in which families can be sanctioned and evicted from shelter. Um, DHS has asked the state for permission to approve its proposed procedure under which families with children, again, can be sanctioned and evicted. We are concerned about this procedure as is currently written, because it allows evictions based on subjective and unreasonable factors, such as not being, and this again is from the policy proposal, tenants not being properly dressed, not keeping a shelter unit, quote, clean and orderly, or bringing more than two bags of belongings into the shelter. Now these are all, uh, in the scheme of things, small factors, and yet under this policy, they could be the basis for a family being evicted from shelter. In addition, the procedures for families with children differs from the one for single adults and adult families without children. In significant <laughs> ways under the new policy, families with children who have a public assistance case and are on sanction status are subject to eviction. This is a huge problem since many recipients are sanctioned due to bureaucratic error and no fault of their own. For years, this committee has heard from public assistance recipients who were erroneously sanctioned, so we know just how big a problem that is in and of itself. Now, families who do not comply with the income contribution requirement are also subject to eviction. Does this mean that we will face larger numbers of street homeless something that all of us who've lived through those years in New York City know we must do everything we can to avoid. And will children be forced into foster care as a result, which will split families apart and create an additional burden for the administration for children's services? Another critical factor we should mention is the pressure that shelter providers now face since DHS is modifying their contracts at the same time under the quote-unquote graduated payment system for family shelters. DHS propo proposes to incentivize permanent housing placements for families in shelter by revising the payment structure for providers. Providers will receive a 10% bonus if they place families within six months and a 20% penalty for families who remain in shelter longer than six months. How realistic is this when, according to DHS's figures from May of this year, the average length of stay in shelter is approximately nine months for a family? And again, these families are faced with all of the negative uh, economic factors that we mentioned earlier. This new payment structure raises serious fears that DHS's standards for ejection will be used liberally to the detriment of families. As we've said before, the mayor and the administration are failing at reaching his stated goal of reducing homelessness by two-thirds by 2009, by this year. These policies, these new policies, are not the way to reduce the numbers of homeless in New York City. We need to focus on successful strategies rather than punitive ones. And that's what we want to talk about today in this hearing. And now uh, we're going to introduce and welcome the first panel, uh, Fran Winter, first, uh, first Deputy Commissioner. 